Good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Standing Committee on Social Development. This evening we will be holding a public hearing on Bill 65, Builders Lean Act, which is available on the Legislative Assembly website. My name is Caitlin Cleveland and I am the MLA for Cam Lake and I am the Chair of the Standing Committee on Social Development. Before we begin, I would like to ask all members to introduce themselves for the record and I will start with the member to my left. Good evening, I'm Katrina Knockleby, MLA for Great Slave. Rocky Simpson, MLA Hay River South. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Excellent, and I will turn it over to the member joining us virtually. Hi, Richard Jericho, and MLA for Trinity Willity. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Bill 65 received second reading in the Legislative Assembly and was referred to the Standing Committee for review on November 3rd, 2022. Bill 65 is sponsored by the Minister of Justice. In this bill, the Government of the Northwest Territories proposes to replace the existing Mechanics Lien Act with a new Builders Lien Act. The existing Mechanics Lien Act was last changed substantially in 1988. Since then, practices and contractual arrangements in construction and real property development changed considerably and continue to evolve. As the Standing Committee on Social Development, it is our job to review and consider Bill 65. An important part of our process is to have an opportunity to hear from you, the public, and our stakeholders. In late November, we distributed stakeholder letters, and today we are pleased to be holding a public hearing. We will consider all feedback we receive, and we will make a report to the Legislative Assembly on our review of Bill 65 during the upcoming session. I will now invite the Honourable R.J. Simpson, Minister of Justice, to deliver any opening remarks on Bill 65. Following the Minister's remarks, committee members may make comments or pose questions related to the scope of the bill. Uh, Minister Simpson, welcome this evening. Uh, we thank you for joining us and I would like to ask you to please introduce yourself and your staff for the record and proceed with any re opening remarks that you may have on the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss Bill 65, Builders Lien Act. The purpose of Bill 65 is to repeal the current Mechanics Lien Act and replace it with a more modern Builders Lien Act to address modern construction practices. Uh, today, I have three witnesses with me, Brad Patzer, Assistant Deputy Minister, Attorney General, Matthew Yap, Director of Legal Registries, and Ian Rennie, Director of Legislation Division with the Department of Justice. And like myself, they're all attending virtually. Madam Chair, lien legislation is in place to ensure that parties who contribute work, labor, or materials to a construction project in the NWT are paid and to provide a remedy if they are not. Lien legislation also creates stability and predictability for owners of construction projects by setting out their obligations to other parties involved in a construction project. The new act will use plain language where possible and take into consideration evolving best practices in construction business and terminology. Some of the existing provisions will be maintained and adjusted. At the same time, substantive changes will be brought forward in 15 areas based on research conducted by the department and engagement with external stakeholders. This concludes my opening remarks and I'd be happy to answer any questions that committee may have. Thank you. And uh, Madam Chair, I will just say that the, the sound in the committee room is a bit glitchy. Um, so you may have to uh, ask you to repeat, repeat yourselves. We're having some trouble hearing you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for letting us know, Minister, and we'll be sure to let technical staff know as well, but please let us know at any time if you need us to slow down or repeat ourselves. Uh, with that, members, I would like to uh, turn the floor over to yourselves. Are there any questions for the Minister this evening? Emily Nakobi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you to the Minister and staff for being here. I'll try to speak a bit slower than I normally do, and maybe that will help with some of the sound. Um, my question is, with this proposed uh, legislation, uh, the GMWT is exempting itself from the ability to have uh, liens put against it. And, and my question is, uh, um, what is the reasoning or rationale behind this, given that, um, you know, people that are hired by the GMWT or contractors and such, they also need to have uh, 
uh, areas or avenues of repercussions or um, dispute resolution or abilities to recoup their money. So can the minister speak a little bit to why the GNWT has decided to exempt themselves from this legislation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily Nockleby, uh, Minister. Thank you for the question. Uh, across Canada, there are uh, different approaches. Uh, some jurisdictions are exempt, other jurisdictions are not. Uh, but I, I would say that no government in Canada is uh, in the same position as a, uh, you know, a private, um, a private company in terms of uh, the requirements under the Act. So the, the government of the Northwest Territories is, is different than a normal property owner. It's very unlikely to ever become insolvent or bankrupt. Um, and there's also the consideration of uh, so the seizing of public assets. So, you know, we, we built a very expensive hospital, and if that were to be seized, that would put uh, every resident in the territory in a very uh, vulnerable position. So uh, those are some of the, you know, the high-level issues. And uh, perhaps I can see if the department has anything to add. I can ask um, through you, Madam Chair, to, to go to Mr. Patzer, and he can hand it off as he sees fit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Mr. Patzer? Thank you, Madam Chair. Not much to add. The minister has nailed all the high-level reasons why the legislation is not uh, applying to the government. Um, to the extent that the legislation does apply to governments in other jurisdictions, it applies to very limited uh, circumstances, as outlined in the, the letters committee from earlier today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Patzer. Emily Knockleby, follow-up? Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for the response. Um, so that being said, and I do understand why we can't have uh, government assets being seized and sold, uh, I then have to wonder why uh, the GNWT hasn't looked to exempt Indigenous governments or municipal governments from the same issue. It is my understanding that the municipalities or the communities uh, will still be allowed to have a lien placed against them. However, uh, the land wouldn't be able to be sold, um, or sorry, a lien against the uh, holdback. But uh, when I look at Indigenous governments, if anything, I think their land is even more so uh, uh, theirs and, and should not be able to be sold. So I'm curious to know why the GNWT thinks that it should be exempt from this, but not Indigenous governments be exempt from this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Emily Nakobi, Minister. Thank you. Sorry, similar to my earlier comment, about the uh, GNWT not becoming insolvent, um, you know, we also have the uh, powers of taxation. So it's it's a very much a different system. Uh, we are proposing to to treat in Indigenous and municipal governments uh, in this legislation uh, similar to how they are treated in, in the rest of Canada. I can again, once again, through you, Madam Chair, go to the department and Mr. Patzer to see if he or any other witnesses have any additional uh, rationale. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Mr. Patzer. Madam Chair, I'll pass the floor to Mr. Yap. Thank you very much, Mr. Was that Mr. Rennie? Yeah. 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 Mr. Madam Mr. Chair, uh, the department did look at those considerations, um, and in response to that, uh, and the only thing I have in addition to the what the minister has said is. Indigenous governments and Indigenous organizations are currently bound by the Mechanics Lien Act, and we do not see the rationale or need or uh, desire from the government to expand the scope of exemptions uh, towards other organizations and make the remedies in the lien legislation even narrower or less able to be re redressed by uh, different organizations. Secondly, the other issue is that the GWT is in a separate category and has a bit of a distinction compared to Indigenous governments. Um, there's more details in one of our previous correspondence with the committee. But in effect, the GWT is unlikely to ever become insolvent or bankrupt or unable to pay its bills uh, like any other uh, uh, debtor or, or person that owes money to a company worker or vendor or supplier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rennie. Uh, Emily Nockleby, I understand you have a quick follow-up. Yeah, I do, and thank you for indulging me. Um, so then, if I'm hearing right, we are actually uh, creating a legislation or a piece that's now in, in uh, conflict with the Constitution uh, and Section 35 for Indigenous rights. Is that correct? Thank you. Thank you, Emily Nockleby, Minister. 
Sorry, could the, the member repeat the question? It was cutting in and out. Uh, yeah, and uh, Emily Knockleby, if you can slow down, I'll pass the floor back to yourself. Thank you. I've had a lot of coffee today. So my question is that it seems to me then that we are creating a piece of legislation that is in conflict with Section 35 federally and Indigenous rights to their land. Uh, can, the, can, can the Minister of the Department speak to that? Thank you. Thank you, Emily Nakobi. Uh, so set that section 35, of course, of the Constitution, Minister. Thank you. So Indigenous governments are free to enter into to contracts if, if they want, um, in the same manner that any other uh, entity is free to enter in, into contracts, and they're treated the same way as, as any other entity. Um, there's, uh, I don't know if there's inherent rights to entering into construction contracts, so um, perhaps for some more elaboration on this, because I have to admit this is not an area that I've uh, given a considerable amount of attention to, I can ask the department to uh, elaborate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Mr. Praxer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if I heard the question correctly, I think the question was about the Indigenous rights and whether they're impacted by contracting. And I don't think Indigenous rights are impacted in this situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patzer. I'll pass the floor over to uh, Emily O'Reilly. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. I guess I'm gonna take another run at this issue of whether the legislation should apply to indigenous owned lands. But if, I'd like to start by asking uh, the minister and the department what consultation, if any, was undertaken with indigenous governments over this piece of uh, legislation before it arrived on our, in the House. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Emily O'Reilly, Minister. Thank you. Um, there was a significant, well, there was an attempt to, uh, to consult uh, significantly with uh, industry and perhaps to elaborate, I can hand it again to the department. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Patzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. There was public consultation done on the bill in 2020. There was nothing specific beyond industry and those who were involved that were targeted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patzer. Uh, Emily O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. That's a problem, especially if this bill is going to apply to Indigenous lands, and that's what the ministers indicated. Um, this is not the Mechanics Lien Act, and the Mechanics Lien Act is a, a product of a different era, a different way of thinking before probably uh, uh, any land rights agreements had actually been signed. So, but having this apply to Indigenous owned lands would allow for effectively expropriation of those lands through the sale of them, through uh, registering of liens and, and the forced sale of Indigenous owned settlement lands that are protected through, you know, uh, constitutionally entrenched land rights agreements. Uh, and I, I don't think that's what we should be doing. You know, GNWT doesn't want its own uh, assets uh, uh, alienated and sold. Why would we not um, offer the same sort of protection to settlement lands that are constitutionally protected? I. Uh, I guess I'd like to get an explanation, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Emily O'Reilly, Minister. Thank you. Um, so the GNWT and Indigenous governments, as have been has been stated, are in, are in different situations. Uh, we don't plan on ever requiring the GNWT. I mean, if the GNWT was included in this, the hope is, the assumption is that we would never, uh, it would never get to this point. Um, indigenous governments, if, if they want to to build something on their land, they want to build build a building, then the uh, you know the contract is working on that. If they're not paid, they can put a lien on that building. So there's an uh, there's an uh, a possibility that an indigenous government might not be able to pay their bills in that instance, right? And then a lien is a way to to address that. So this is um, I think we are conflating two different entities, two different types of entities. Uh, I take the member's point. I, once again, perhaps I can hand it to the department to see if they have, uh, you know, some more scholarly comments to to make on this. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Patzer. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, nothing really to add to the minister's response other than to echo his comment that in, in these circumstances, the Aboriginal organization or Indigenous government is acting as a commercial party. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Patzer. Emily Simpson. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I kind of get where you guys are coming from on this. And, and then if we're talking about, I guess, the, the land claims and those agreements, uh, uh, I don't have anything in front of me, so I'm hoping that there is some protections in there as there is in uh, on, on reserves as well for uh, for properties in that owned by, by Indians. So, you know, but, but I think there should have, you know, there should be some consultation. I'm not sure how it is in, in Southern Canada. If, uh, you know, if there has been liens put against indigenous lands or not, and what the outcome of that was, but that's something I guess I would like to know, and I guess we can get our researchers to look into that. But one thing I guess when I look at this bill and I look at what, you know, kind of what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to achieve is to make sure that contractors, subcontractors who actually do work get paid. So how do we do that when they're doing government work? And to me, that means we have to be looking at, uh, you know, a sure, if it's a surety bond, if it's uh, holdbacks or whatever it is, uh, we got to make sure that at least those contractors, the main contractor, can lean and put a lien against that against that that holdback, and uh, even though it's it, it's held by the government, so I'm not sure where that is in here, but it, it's something I would like to see. Uh, subcontractors themselves, they can they can go after after the contractor as well, uh, you know, for the for the bond that they they put in place. So, yeah, uh, you may want to speak on you know on on. You know, if you looked at that, or how you know how we could address it, because again, and the other the other uh, second point there too, is that uh, we have issues with uh, with the contracts themselves. Uh, when we look at government contracts, they're sort of cut and paste, and uh, at least that's what I've seen. And I think we have to look at a, a different approach to it, and that's you know. And, and I think the best thing would be to use the uh, standard forms by, you know, that the Canadian Construction Association puts out. So just two things there if you want to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, Emily Simpson. Minister Simpson. Thank you. I understand that the Department of uh, Finance is undertaking a procurement review. So I think that might address some of those issues. And for the first part of the comments, I will ask the department to answer through you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Patzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll pass the floor to uh, Mr. Matthew Yap, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, we we very much appreciate the comments made by the member. Um, the main purpose of lien legislation is to make sure that a worker or a supplier is able to get paid and seek recourse if that does not happen. While we also appreciate there are, there are some instances where a balance has to be struck to make sure that important public infrastructure or services aren't disrupted in such a process to resolve such payment disputes. And as a result, we have cases in this legislation talking about exemptions, pullbacks, liens, bonds, et cetera. And the department feels that we struck an appropriate balance based upon these uh, different interests and purposes that the bill is trying to achieve based upon uh, our own research and the jurisdictional stance from, from other jurisdictions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Emily Simpson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, looking, I guess, from a, say, a contractor side of things is that, you know, again, they need to get paid and, you know, and, and how do we do it? It, and it's a simple, and it's a simple, uh, you know, uh, it should be a simple process and a simple answer. And, uh, you know, and that's through uh, being able to lean, lean holdbacks. You know, we want to be fair. Uh, and, and when we look at government, we've got, you know, we've, we're holding the property, we're holding the money, and we're basically holding everything where the contractor has really nothing. And uh, so there's no fairness in that. So we have to, if we're talking fairness, then we should be talking about making sure that if there is holdbacks, we, uh, there is an option for the uh, contractor to actually uh, lean that, that, that holdback. And I don't think it would be a lot of work to make sure that's, that's kind of included in, in this as well. 
So, and you know, we have trouble uh, getting contractors come up north. We have trouble getting contractors even wanting to do work for the government because I know that it's just too much trouble. And I know we've got, you know, uh, buildings that are sitting empty because of uh, issues as well. So it, it's just something that I, you know, I would uh, ask, you, ask you to consider and, uh, and look at doing that because they would provide some fairness and it might encourage, uh, you know, more, more contractors to spring up here in, in the territories and knowing that, uh, that there's a chance they're actually going to get paid, uh, you know, for government work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily Simpson. Minister Simpson. Thank you. Um, so I, I'll take the, I take the comments. Um, you know, we can bring them back to the department, have a discussion. Uh, the how the GNWT handles its procurement, how it pays, uh, all of that. That is primarily with the Department of Finance. Uh, but those are comments that we can bring back. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Emily O'Reilly. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. I'm just going to go back to the. The fact that there was no uh, consultation with Indigenous governments on this, yet the bill is going to apply to their settlement lands. I have a funny feeling that uh, their Indigenous governments will actually have some pretty strong views on that. And because the government didn't do it, I think committees now placed in the uh, situation where we're going to have to do some of that work. Um, but. Uh, I guess um, I do want to move on to, um, you know, one of the, all the correspondence between this committee and the, the, the government house leader, the minister, is confidential. We, 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 you know, the public doesn't get to see any of this, so it's not really helpful if um, the departmental staff say, well, we address that in, 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 in letters to the committee. That do, doesn't help the public understand any of these issues. So, uh, but I, one of the things I do want to ask about is uh, that is the subject of this correspondence is this uh, concept of uh, substantial completion. And there is no definition of substantial completion in the bill anywhere. And this is, you know, this is how contractors get paid, subcontractors co contractors get paid. If there's no guidance in the bill itself around how that's defined, um, I don't know how that actually provides for any kind of a balance or uh, a dispute resolution process other than throwing it back into the hands of the parties. That's not very helpful. I don't think there's even a mention in the bill of alternative dispute resolution, you know, suggesting that, you know, maybe the parties might look at mediation or arbitration if they can afford it. But to just have that, that uh, key definition in here without without it, sorry, that key terminology, without any kind of definition, just leaves it open to the parties having to fight amongst themselves uh, with no guidance from the, the, the legislation itself. So I guess I'd like to get some comments from the minister about why that key concept has no definition in here and there's not even any suggestion of how disputes might get resolved other than throwing it back to the parties to sort it out. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Emily O'Reilly, Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to hand it to the department. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Patzer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I take the member's point that the, the term substantially, uh, substantial performance is not in the definition section. It is described, however, in section two of the bill, and it describes substantially performed and the improvement uh, to be made under the contract is a substantial part of it is ready for use or is being used for purposes of it, and the description of substantially performed goes on. Um, in terms of the dispute resolution options available to parties, um, it wasn't uh, outlined in this piece of legislation, but it is up to the parties to determine how they want to resolve their disputes and their contractual arrangements. It's open to the parties to use other tools that are available to them, such as the new Arbitration Act that was recently passed by the Legislative Assembly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Patzer. And if you can slow down just a little bit on your answers uh, going forward, that would help committee members who are furiously writing as well. Uh, Emily O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'm furiously trying to look at Section 2, which I guess there is a, uh, 
definition for substantial, substantially performed, and I'm not sure that's the same as substantial completion, but I'll get my own advice on that. Um, I, uh, I just don't think that the bill probably, uh, the bill should have allowed for or encouraged or found a way to even mention that alternative dispute resolution um, uh, process might be a, a way for parties to address the situation. But I want to move on to the application of the, the bill to uh, the government of the Northwest Territories. Um, I'm sorry, I just don't buy the arguments I've heard. My understanding is that um, uh, the following jurisdictions in Canada have uh, made this kind of uh, legislation applicable to themselves, with some exceptions uh, around, you know, uh, public uh, infrastructure not uh, being sold. But the federal government, Nunavut government, BC government, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Nova Scotia, and PEI all to some extent allow for the application of similar legislation to their own their own stuff. Except you can't sell crown owned lands, okay. Uh, and then there's a few, a few other jur jurisdictions that don't do this, but most of the ones in Western Canada do it this way. So why, and because we're, why are we not looking at best practices? I, the government of the Northwest Territories is the main contracting authority, the main spender on construction, contracts, uh, you know, in, in the Northwest Territories. Uh, why would we not adopt the BC approach and, and allow for uh, liens uh, to be filed against us, except you can't sell the assets, you can't sell, uh, you know, uh, public infrastructure, but it would, I think, help facilitate um, contractors and subcontractors actually getting money at the end of the day, and maybe quicker. Uh, so I just don't buy the arguments I've heard so far, and I guess uh, if you want to take another run at it, but if this is not fixed, I'm going to be voting against the bill. Thanks. Thank you very much, Emily O'Reilly. And I know this is a significant concern of committee. Uh, Minister? Thank you. Uh, the comments are noted. I look forward to uh, any amendments committee might want to bring forward on this. Uh, it's not the end of the world if we wind up um, uh, amending this legislation. It will, there's a chance it's going to cost the government more um, we'll spend more time in the courts, but if that is the wish of committee, if, it, if this is the issue that committee is uh, really focused on and sees as um, you know a do or die issue, then let's uh, let's talk about it. Um, you know, you're going to get the same answer from me over and over again with the same question about this, uh, but I'm happy to uh, explore options. Thank you. Thank you, Minister uh, MLA Knockleby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I just want to echo my colleagues' concerns about the lack of engagement with Indigenous governments, and, and uh, I too feel disappointment with some of the responses from the department, uh, especially given, you know, well, it was this way with the Mechanics Lean Act, and, and we're just going to continue on that way. Um, I do agree with Member O'Reilly that, that, you know, that's an old way of doing things, and, and if I, I, I really am struggling to wrap my head around why we would create legislation that doesn't uh, extend the same courtesies to our Indigenous uh, uh, colleagues, for lack of a better word, uh, that we would extend to ourselves. And so um, I would like to see that both the GNWT and the Indigenous governments be treated the same way that you're proposing to treat the municipal governments. Um, so such that there is holdbacks, such that there is the opportunity to pass liens against each, but not uh, the ability to sell the lands and and I agree with uh, member O'Reilly's comments that other jurisdictions have done this so uh, the comment or the response I got earlier that others were were exempting themselves was not quite uh, fulsome or correct um, so to me again I uh, if there's not going to be a uh, a point where this would then come into play for the GNWT because they have all of their their money and all of that. Well, then great. So what does it matter then to include yourself then in the legislation? Uh, I do agree also with the comments that this would make for a much faster uh, dispute resolution for contractors. I numerous times, like my colleague, have heard uh, about how. Uh, onerous it is to do business with the GNWT and I know that from my first uh, hand experience and most companies are not even going to bother 
to deal with trying to litigate against the GMWT because uh, they don't like to dig in their heels and, and not uh, not concede when they've made a mistake. So um, again, probably more comments. I'm assuming that the minister is probably going to give me the same response he gave my colleague. However, uh, I do think that you need to hold yourself to the same standard that you're holding others. Uh, and and why would we ask or put it on our municipalities? Uh, something that we wouldn't allow for ourselves. And I, and I come back to the indemnity clause around the insurance that uh, the GNWT tried to or put in place about, uh, sorry, the, the indemnity clause to do with contracting around engineering services where basically the engineers would have to take 100% uh, liability for all projects into perpetuity to the point where our insurance companies wouldn't even allow us to sign those contracts. Uh, but the GNWT thought that they should just throw in clauses that then allow themselves to never be held accountable. So therefore, that's what this seems to me, that this is just another way that the GNWT is looking to, to not have to be accountable to people. Thank you. Uh, Minister? The member is correct. I, I don't have a new response. It's the same one that I, I provided to the other member, um, but I, I appreciate the comments. Um, thank you. Minister Emily Simpson? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, can you tell me if the lands uh, under a federal claim are outside, I guess, GN GNWT lands? They're separate, they're owned uh, by the Indigenous groups. Is that a fair statement? Thank you. Thank you, Emily Simpson. Minister Simpson? Thank you. Might be a bit of a loaded statement. I'm not sure. I will uh, hand it off to the department to provide a response if you don't mind. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Passer. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I don't know. I didn't quite catch the question. Could it be repeated, please? Ms. Uh, Emily Simpson. Uh, thank you. I just want to. I just. I just want clarity on uh, whether the lands uh, under a federal claim are separate from GNWT lands. They're, they're not owned by the GNWT. Uh, they're owned by the Indigenous groups. They're not fee simple lands. And I just, I just need that clarity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Emily Simpson, Minister Simpson. Or, sorry. Uh, thank you again. I'm gonna have to hand this to the department. Um, the question was whether lands under a federal claim, um, and I assume a settled land claim, I'm not sure which one, but whether those are separate from GNWT lands. Uh, so if the department has heard that, if you could pass it to them, uh, Madam Chair, and see if they can provide an answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patzer. Thank you. On a very high level, Madam Chair, I think I can say that uh, there are, under some of the land claims, there are pieces of land that are owned by Indigenous governments and organizations. Um, there are also other lands upon which they exercise rights uh, on a very general basis. I think I can leave my response at that. That satisfies the question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patzer. Emily Simpson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So is it fair to say then that the Indigenous governments uh, would have the opportunity to look at their own land registry system uh, uh, separate and apart from what we, the GNWT, have in place right now? And uh, so they could administer their own lands and uh, and kind of have their own laws uh, with respect to uh, you know uh, how they're dealt with. Thank you. Thank you, Emily Simpson, Minister Simpson. Thank you. I will once again have to hand it to the department. Thanks, Minister Simpson, uh, Mr. Patzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will ask Mr. Yap to address this question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patzer, Mr. Yap. Thank you, Mr. Ch Madam Chair. Uh, to answer the question, uh, I think there's two parts to the question. One is uh, there's a difference between land administration and land registration. I think the first part of the question was what Indigenous governments administering the lands, which is separate and apart from the registration and the land registration with the land titles office. Um, right now, any settled land claim agreement provides for how an Indigenous government can administer their lands. Um, and uh, a lot, most of it is registered in the land titles office of Northwest Territories. In all the previous land claim agreements that were done in this jurisdiction in the Northwest Territories, all of those 
agreements had provision for the Land Tales Office of Northwest Territories to be used, and they, that office was sought to be used by all the parties, being both the federal government, the Northwest Territories, and the indigenous governments to use the existing system with the North Land Tales Office of Northwest Territories. There was only one jurisdiction in the country where an indigenous government instituted their own Land Tales Office, and that is the Mishka Nation in British Columbia. Everywhere else in the country, they've used the existing provincial or territorial land sales offices. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Yap. Uh, MLA Simpson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I guess, you know, when I look at this, it, it you know, it gets pretty convoluted and, uh, and, it, and especially the North here, where we, where we have a number of uh, 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 indigenous governments and uh, the, their ability maybe to get together and, uh, and do something uh, with a, a new land registry system. When really what we should be talking about is how can we make sure that contractors get paid? That seems to be the bottom line. And I think we could avoid a lot of this through consultation and just making sure we have the right, uh, you know, the right wording in the, in the act to make sure that uh, contractors uh, and subcontractors are looked after, thank you. Thank you, Emily Simpson. Minister Simpson, do you care to comment? Thank you. I appreciate the point on consultation, and um, I hope committee makes sure that, that we have all the right words in the act. That is the role of committee, and uh, I know you work hard at it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Next on my list, I have Emily Adjerkon. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just a quick question to the, the uh, minister in regards to uh, consultation and commendation uh, in regards to these act um, amendments. Um, I guess my question to, would be that have uh, the Indigenous government been consulted on in regards to some of these amendments and what kind of feedback did you get? Thank you. Thank you, Emily Jericon, Minister. Thank you. Consultation was general public consultation. Um, I don't believe there was any feedback from uh, Indigenous governments but the department can correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Minister. Emily Adjerkong? Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I, I'm just thinking as well that, uh, you know, uh, speaking as a former chief um, as well, um, you know, we already know the history here in the Northwest Territories, right down to the territory government going back in 1967. and. You know, we you know we got we talk about the treaties, we talk about the Palette case, we got, we talk about the ongoing claims and and those kind of things. And um, I know these claims that are out there as well that uh, you know they got language in there that talks about uh, you know uh, when it comes down to a situation uh, or or conflict um, that the, their claim will over or supersede the territory government uh, act and etc. So. Um, I guess I guess what I'm thinking is that um, we I guess we what what do you want to do here if you got to do this thing right I mean we you know if you have to take the time to consult with indigenous governments because what we're talking about is significant uh, because you know here now we're talking about government to government to government relationships and and if this if it's the will of this government to start looking at uh, devolving a lot of these responsibilities to indigenous governments so then then you know I don't know why we don't go as far as to look at protecting indigenous governments lands um, to, uh, so that no different than the territorial government. Um, that's another quick question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Emily Jericon, Minister. Sorry, what was the question? Uh, <laughs> the, I will pass the microphone back to Emily Jericon. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. No, I, I guess um, to the minister is that uh, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, we already know the history here in the North in terms of land claims, the Territory Government, Territory Act of 1967, uh, you know, the claims that have been settled here now. And, you know, we, we, it, when I was in, in, in the Aboriginal politics, you know, we always talk about, you know, government to government to government relationship and how we're going to move forward, and how we're going to coexist, and how we're going to work and live together. Uh, and um, you know we're trying to look at a way to um, do things right. And uh, but what I heard earlier is that um, you know the the exemption of the territorial government 
um, and then versus the municipalities, etc. Um, again, I don't know. I, I am I'm I'm concerned that um, you know if we, if we go down this road where uh, something goes sideways and uh, um, you know then there'll be an opportunity to to uh, really shrink the the land claim agreements in terms of the lands for indigenous governments because you know if things do go sideways so I don't know we got to figure this thing out right but my concern is you know accommodations and and consultation you know um, you know if, if I guess I want to make sure that we do this right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Emily Adjurkon, uh, Minister. Thank you, and I'm, I'm hearing committee loud and clear. Uh, committee's not happy with uh, the consultation that was done on this bill back in 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Emily Simpson, or Minister Simpson, Emily Simpson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, you know, I, I we got to move ahead, I think, and you know we have an opportunity here to, to you know to set the bar when it comes to uh, you know uh, to this act, and especially when with the indigenous participation, make sure that you know that they have a say, and uh, and I'm hoping that you know when committee does their work and, and provides the recommendations that uh, the department uh, and yourself take a look and, and uh, consider it, and you know. Uh, and uh, review it and i know there'll be probably comments coming back but uh you know we have an opportunity to, i think uh, to be a leader here when you start to look at, at at what's being done around canada right now or what's not being done so uh, that's just a comment thank you thank you emily simpson minister simpson uh would you like to respond um thank you for the comment this is this is a, a law of general application no one is trying to expropriate indigenous lands um Ideally, you know, no one will ever have to put a lien on anything because everyone's going to pay their bills. Um, but I, I'm, I'm hearing over and over again from committee that the committee would like the GNWT to be included. The committee would like there to be more consultation with Indigenous governments. I, I, I have no further comments on either of those. I, I think I've said all that I have to say on them. I'm, I can't really, I, I don't have anything else for you on those ones. But uh, thank you for the comments. I, uh, they're being strongly um, impressed upon me. And uh, I uh, look forward to any further correspondence from the committee uh, with any further suggestions. And I look forward to the work that committee will be doing um, in terms of consulting Indigenous governments. Uh, this is a very complex bill. Uh, we received very limited feedback from those who it's going to impact most directly in the construction industry. So I, I hope that um, the committee is able to solicit um, uh, some some views from Indigenous governments that will help uh, this process and ensure that we have the best legislation in Canada. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. And, uh, you know, we we have a full expectation that a bill that we receive over on this side is, is gone through a um, extensive consultation and engagement process. And, well, you know, of course, committee did send uh, stakeholder letters out to all stakeholders, including Indigenous governments. Um, this really is something that uh, committee fully expects is done beforehand. With that being said, committee does want to say thank you to the department. I know that we did also send uh, this week a letter with questions and a tight turnaround, and I want to acknowledge that the department did work very hard to, you know, reply with a seven-page letter uh, replying to our questions, and, and committee acknowledges that and really does appreciate that. So we, we thank you for that, and uh, committee has asked a, a lot of questions here this evening of yourself and the department, and so thank you for for giving us this time here as well. And I know that you will be hearing hearing back from committee, so we, we appreciate that. Um, members, does committee agree that this stage of our public hearing is now concluded? There are no further questions, excellent. Um, thank you very much and a huge thank you to the public. There are, are no witnesses here this evening from the public uh, to, to make presentations to committee. Um, our, our submission deadline for written submissions has not yet closed, so I invite uh, anybody from the public who would like to uh, provide a written submission to committee to do so. The email address for that uh, is committees at ntassembly.ca, and you can also reach out to um, myself or any of the other MLAs if you want further information as to how to do that as well. So we would like to keep those lines of communication open with anybody that would like to participate um, in the review of this bill. 
So we have now concluded our, our public hearing. Thank you so much to anyone from the public who has uh, joined us here this evening and followed along. And thank you again, Minister uh, and the Department for your time and your, your um, patience with our, our questions this evening. We very much thank you for that. So we will now end the public portion of this evening's meeting for social development. So thank you. Thank you, everyone.